<clears throat> Welcome back, Cam to Catholic. All right, let's get into it. So I wanted to start off with a um, couple different things, but I made a promise to a bunch of y'all, so I have to uh, make sure I have a guest actually come into this flip with me. Um, Rufio. Come here, baby. Come here, buddy. Rufio. Get up. I know you're laying down down there. Rufio. While I'm waiting on him, go ahead and jot this down. You want to put this somewhere actually in your notes next to where we were talking about Homer, right? And his tales about the Trojan War. Oh, here he is. Ero. Oh. So this is Rufio. He's very sweet boy. Okay. And he's very... And this is Josie, unfortunately. Right, anyway, now, but this is my baby. He's a little mutt baby, and I told y'all I would actually put him in this thing. So he's going to hang out with me while I'm actually doing it, all right? I'm going to mush his face a little bit. So, now, when we left off, we were talking about um, the fall of the Mycenaeans, um, talking about their destruction by the Dorians, right? Now, speaking of that, though, uh, we ended up getting a little bit kind of messed up. I feel like a lot of y'all got a little confused. Mainly we were, we were talking about how the Mycenaeans and their destruction by the Dorians is a real-life thing. But the biggest part of Mycenaean history that was a little confusing to some of y'all was their, rule, their war with Troy, the city-state of Troy, right? Now, we talked about how we don't believe that the horse was actually real. We talked about how there were some very mythical um, ideas and different things that happened in that story. But... We got confused and caught up with which story is about the Trojan War, right? Well, if you look right here, tr uh, the Trojan War and Homer, right, the guy who actually wrote these stories, except for one of them, which is over here, are all actually interrelated. Come back. Oh, he's going to go lay down now. He's a hound dog. He sleeps like at least 12 hours a day. Um, now, anyway, so biggest thing is that the Trojan War was actually the foundational event for several stories by Homer. The biggest one and premier one is the Iliad, which came first, right? The Iliad is about Achilles and his um, really, really big quarrels with the king of the Mycenaeans, known as Agamemnon, and the destruction of Troy in the final months of their war. And then it moves into the Odyssey, which is about Odysseus and his return home from the war. And then you've got another poem called the Aeneid, which is actually written by a completely different guy by the name of Virgil, who was a Roman, and that was written about over 700 years later, but it's when they would actually claim that they were descendant of the Trojans, right? Just wanted to give you a heads up about that. But in class, we stopped right here with a lot of different, you know, um, different sections, I guess you could say. The Mycenaeans would actually be driven out of their homes by a tribe called the Dorians, right? Now, the Dorians are what you consider modern-day Greeks, right? Um, darker skin, more of the Mediterranean um, <clears throat> skin tone, hair color, things like that. The Dorians were actually what we believe is a nomadic tribe that actually came in and tried to settle and ended up uh, causing a collapse of the Mycenaean people. Now, a lot of historians are a little kind of on the outs about this. They don't really know for sure um, if this is actually 100% factual, but it's what we've come to understand in the community as of up to this point. Due to the fact that the Mycenaeans were so militaristic and very, very advanced for an ancient civilization, they had a writing system that we can understand barely little bits and pieces of it, because some of it is in modern-day Greek. But uh, since they were so militaristic, it's kind of hard to imagine that a nomadic tribe of people actually came in and destroyed them. However, uh, this is the accepted truth as of right now. Some historians believe that it actually may have been a famine that caused the uh, death of the Mycenaeans, right? But the Dorians would call themselves Hellenas, which in modern day language means Greek, right? But Dorians is still a very important word, so underline that, because they become the basis of what you know as Greeks, right? Them and the Ionians, anyway. The Ionians settled Athens, but the Dorians actually settled Greek or settled Sparta, which is one of the guys we're getting into later. Hmm. Then ushered in the Dark Ages, right? Now the Dark Ages is one giant step backwards. So this is, begins a time of wandering and famine. Trade is going to all but cease. Many skills are going to be forgotten, including how to read and write. All like the whole historical community is pretty po proof positive that actually that the Dark Ages Greeks were a completely illiterate society that they actually didn't know how to read or write whatsoever, or kind of chronicle any of their ideas in a historic fashion, right? Now, they also forgot how to fresco paint, how to work with ivory and gold. 
One of the weirdest things is, though, that they actually begin smelting bronze. So, or not bronze, excuse me, iron. They began to smell iron and actually create iron tools, which is a giant step forward. But we'll get to that here in a couple of minutes. Now, the only record that we have of the Dark Ages, Dark Ages is of the blind poet Homer's stories. The Iliad, the Odyssey, and then later on Virgil's Aeneid, right? Now, it is said, though, that he traveled and spread these stories of the Iliad and, oh, wow, it's supposed to say and the Odyssey right there. So make sure you have the Odyssey in your notes. If it says and T in your notes, I'll know you muted me. So make sure you don't do that. If you want, put a little smiley face next to it. All right. So anyway, but continuing forward, like I said, Homer is really the only only account that we have of anything that happened during the Dark Ages or any intellectual activity. But the people are going to have to create a new civilization. And they're going to begin this by basically getting back down to the old ways of doing things, by herding and farming. Sparta and Athens, though, are going to rise out of this, the ashes of the Dark Ages and start the archaic period of Greece that we actually know the most about today. So let me go ahead and pull up the next, pre there we go. So go ahead and write archaic Greece, right? So archaic Greece is much more about the development of the classical Greek period that you know of. The one that has to do mostly with art, culture, athletics, things like that. In this particular presentation, if you see words that have a star or an asterisk next to it, it means it's a title, all right? It means it's a title in your notes, so like a little subject divider, okay? But let's get straight into it so we don't uh, take up too much time. But we know that geography is going to shape a lot of these new city states. So you see the asterisk right here, that means it's a title. You don't have to put the asterisk in your notes, it's really up to you. So anyway, now geography is going to shape a lot of these new city states. Greece, of course, is a part of the Balkan Peninsula, or the Balkan region of Europe in general. So, however, geographic isolationism, which is what we've talked about before already, we're going to lead to the establishment of a lot of new and very unique city-states. Now, geographic isolationism being the idea that literally geographic bodies are going to separate these people from actually communicating from each other. Now, later on, they're going to actually discuss things with each other due to trade routes, which we'll get to in about two seconds. But this is the mountain range right here that actually separates them, right? So the very mountainous terrain actually prevented people like the Spartans, which were down here, from discussing anything with the Athenians, which were all the way over there. So, <clears throat> but we've already talked about this, so let's keep going, right? Now, see the, the sea, though, and the ocean, or not the ocean, but the Aegean Sea and the Mediterranean Sea are going to provide a vital link for trade, which is eventually going to bring the city-states into contact with another, one another down the line following their development. Now, the best thing that we always like to ask, though, is what they trade, right? Like, what are archaic Greeks trading? Anybody want to take a guess? Trey? Very nice job. I heard that answer. Olives is a big one, right? Because it's actually something that will grow there naturally. Uh, anybody else got another one? Nate, I got you over there. Very, very nice. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. But uh, pottery was a big thing as well that Greeks would actually trade. And I'll take one more guess. One more guess. Very nice job. All the way in the back. Tiana. Good stuff, right? They would also trade eels. I know you didn't actually say that, but still. So olive oil, wine, eels, cheese, honey, fine pottery, a lot of these different items that the Greeks would trade. So right somewhere very, very quickly too, nearby this, agriculture would begin to grow. So the Greeks actually figured out different methods to grow things that were actually native to Greece. Small base vegetables, uh, <clears throat> a lot of olives, a lot of grapes, a lot of vine bearing fruit. And they would actually grow those ideas or grow <clears throat> those agricultural bases quite a bit. Uh, herding and meat keeping was actually another large thing that was a part of uh, the archaic Greek economy. However, it was very, very difficult to keep very big herds due to the fact that there's not a lot of very good natural growing vegetation in Greece to feed them with. Another big thing that they would actually uh, trade as well is cereals. Yeah, that's right. I said it. Cereals, as in grains, right? Barley, oats, wheat things like that, right? So you can write cereals down there as well. And then I'll ask y'all a random, like I'll ask that in the warm up. Be like, other than olive oil, wine, eels, cheese, honey, and fine pottery, what they trade. All right, so anyway, now, but of course that's olive oil right there. That is uh, wine as well. And then this is another title. Now we gotta talk about the big cultural leaps in archaic Greece, right? We're talking about like the cultural basis of Greece itself, okay? So let's keep going, let me check my time, make sure I'm not gonna, Nice! We're coming in perfect right now. So one of the biggest things during the Archaic period that the Greeks actually learned how to do, that was a major part of their trade society, is coining money, which is an idea that they established actually from the early Persians. Persians, under this guy named King Darius I, actually began the first market-based money economy. 
Before that, what do you think all everything was based off of? Anybody? Good job, Olivia. It was actually based on uh, bartering, which is like trading. Like I'll give you this, so much of this for so much of that. But the archaic Greeks are actually going to adopt coinage system, which is amazing. The Greeks are also going to develop their various, the very first, their very own simple alphabet, developed off the very first simple alphabet from the Phoenicians. Right? Remember what? It, quick review: How many, uh, how many letters did the Phoenician alphabet have in it? Very nice job, Mara. That is exactly right. Twenty-two letters. But what was their alphabet actually missing? Good job, Jeremiah. Vowels didn't have any vowels. However. The Greeks are going to add vowels to theirs, right? So, and they're going to create the very first simple Greek alphabet, which is actually the basis of the alphabet that we use today. So, the archaic period is also going to see the development of very large athletic events that you now know as the Olympics, right? So, the prize for winning the Olympics, though, was actually immortality and an olive wreath. That's all you got. So, there are monetary prizes today during the modern day Olympics. It's not the same, though, in ancient Greece. Also, the events that we have today are not exactly like the ones that they actually participated in Greece. One of the things that's going to stand out to you immediately there on this piece of pottery right here is actually the fact that the figure is completely naked. Now, talking about him being completely naked, uh, he actually had to compete that way. The archaic Greeks actually completed, competed completely in the nude, right? And a lot of their events include things like discus, javelin, a lot of the track and field events, the stade, which is just a race, chariot racing, wrestling, boxing, Boxing was actually done completely bare knuckle as well. The Spartans apparently like swept the competition for years. We also saw the major developments of Greek art, right? They actually began to adopt different types of sculpture. And they also integrated the thing that you know of best, the black and red figure pottery. All right. So when you think of Greek art, you usually typically think of things like you see below. Uh, there we go. So sculpture being full form, and a lot of times in early Greek sculpture, sculptures, the figures would actually have one foot in front of the other, symbolizing motion. However, it's like some of them were not the best in archaic Greece, because as time goes on and prevails, sculpture would adapt natural movements. A thing in the Renaissance that we call contraposto, which is elongating one side of your body to try and show slimness. And then as well, the black and red figure pottery would actually be used as historiography. A lot of ancient myths and major historical events would be recorded on the side of vases and pottery, right? So, well, let's keep going after it. Um, there you go. And, oh, see, the foot forward implying motion. And then right here, this is one of the red figure potteries. So, keep going, though. Now we got to talk about governing the city-states, right? So, biggest thing is, is that each city-state was actually governed from the polis, right? So, every single city-state was known as a polis, P-O-L-I-S which actually is a word root that we use today to describe the word city. You know of certain words like metropolis. And we're going to stop right here for today, all right? And then we're going to get after it a little bit more on Monday. But the archaic Greek polis, or Greek city-state, is uh, that polis word is used in metropolis, necropolis, which is actually necropolis means city of the dead. It's a graveyard, right? So it consists of two parts. The acropolis, the high city, is the thing that's built up on a hill, right? Um, higher elevation, it contains huge marble temples dedicated to different gods and goddesses, typically from the patron saint of each city-state, right? Hmm. For example, the patron saint of Sparta was Ares, and... Oh, no. What's the goddess of the hunt? Why can I not... Artemis! Ha! <laughs> so, the goddess of the hunt, or the god of the hunt, Artemis. And then also, the Athenians, where they dedicated their city to Athena, Athens. So, anyway... Now, the walled main city was actually below it. So you've got the Acropolis up here and the lower walled main city down here, which actually cont contains a lot of different things, different public buildings. But the main thing is, is the Agora, right? The Agora is down below, and the Agora is one of the biggest hubs in the entire Greek city-state, all right? It's a major meeting area for ideas, the exchange of goods, and kind of the basis of the Greek market economy. But that's where we're going to stop. Y'all banged out a ton of information just now. Very, very proud. We kept it to a decent about 14 minute flip, right? And I mean, for a minute, I was literally talking to my dog. So, but anyway, yeah. So going to like knowing all this stuff is very important, right? And you got to hear me say all oh, again. So calm down. You'll be fine. All of Now, anyway, I hope you all have a fantastic weekend. I'll probably see some of y'all tonight at homecoming. And uh, yeah, so have a great weekend. See you guys later. Go birds, baby.